We are going to get going. Uh, we've been in this series on the questions of Jesus. And uh, as I've shared over the past couple of weeks, uh, Jesus asked a lot of questions in his brief three-year ministry to the public. Uh, something like 307 questions that are recorded in the Gospels. And as I mentioned in the past, uh, the questions that he asked weren't really to provide Jesus with more information. And the more that I've now thought about it, I would even say that the purpose of his questions weren't even really to provide the one being questioned with more information or more knowledge. In fact, uh, I think that maybe there's a different angle or maybe a different way that we can look at these questions in the sense that when Jesus questioned an individual, he wasn't looking for an opening so that he could then, you know, provide knowledge in order to enlighten the individual's mind or anything like that. That might have been part of it. But the questions of Jesus at its core was an invitation to engage the individual in conversation. And I think that's actually still very much true today. Uh, Jesus isn't looking to be a dispensary of information in our lives. I mean, certainly our faith does involve knowledge. And, and the, but the essence of Christian faith, really, is that Jesus is looking to engage with you and to be in a living relationship with you. Uh, what Jesus wants most in our lives is not to be our answer man or to be our miracle worker. Uh, sometimes I think maybe our faith would be a whole lot easier for us if that were the case, right? I mean, we could just go to Jesus for everything and pretty much abdicate all of our responsibilities. I think words like Savior, God, King, titles that have been given to Jesus, and rightfully so, but titles that I think we in the Christian circle might overemphasize to the exclusion of the fact that more than once Jesus referred to his disciples as friends. And what does a friend mean to you, if not someone to come alongside you in this journey of life and offer you support and love and encouragement and even constructive criticism whenever it's necessary. Another title of Jesus, and I grabbed this from off of the internet, I, I realize it's kind of getting a little bit early on the Christmas theme, but another title of Jesus is Wonderful Counselor. Now, as I shared, and many of you know, I went to see a counselor for the better part of 10 years of my life. And do you know what counselors, therapists do more than anything else? They ask you questions. I was not prepared for that. So many questions. How'd that make you feel? Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> what were you hoping for? What do you want, Scott? What do you want? What do you really want? Well, where did that come from? What's that response? Where did that come from? I mean, so many questions. At first, when I was going to see this counselor, I remember thinking to myself, you're supposed to give me something to help me with this pain and this confusion, but you just keep asking questions and it's actually confusing me more, and I can get that for free. So what am I paying you for? But in time, you learn that the questions, when they are skillfully asked, help you to better process through the issues yourself, to really think through the issues yourself. And in the end, that's really the best way to learn and to grow in our struggles. In many ways, I think this captures a very important aspect of Jesus' presence in our lives. In addition to being our Savior and Lord, he is also our counselor. Uh, one who comes alongside to help us navigate life and faith. I found this on the internet. How does that, that make you feel? <laughs> kind of a different vibe to it, huh? You know? And I think Jesus comes alongside us to help us navigate life. And in doing so, he continues to ask questions. 
questions that will reach down into our souls and truly require us to think through and process through important matters of our lives. But questions that ultimately have as its aim an invitation to engage with him in a relationship. Uh, today, we turn our attention to a question that Jesus asked a paralyzed man. Do you want to get well? As the slide indicates, it comes from the fifth chapter of John, the Gospel of John. And we're going to read about this encounter, uh, starting with verse 1. It's on your handout. will not be on the slide, so if you don't have a handout, you might want to grab one real quick. But here's what it reads. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See? You are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Jesus was in Jerusalem for a Jewish festival. We don't know which festival, but there were three festivals throughout the year where many people would make a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, these were the festival of Passover, which became tied with the exodus of the Jewish people from out of Egyptian slavery. Uh, the festival of Pentecost, uh, that became associated with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And the festival of Tabernacles, that remembered the 40 years that Jesus, uh, not Jesus, the Israelites wandered in the desert and they lived in these temporary shelters. So the context of this passage is that Jesus is in Jerusalem for one of the big three festivals. And so the city would have just been full of people, much, much more than normal. And the atmosphere of the city would have been much more festive and lively. And yet, for some reason, Jesus walked over to what was called the Sheep Gate on the north side of Jerusalem, which was called the Sheep Gate because that's the gate through which shepherds would bring their sheep or bring their lambs to the market to be purchased for sacrifice. If you look at this first century map of Israel, uh, Jerusalem actually, you can see the Sheep Gate way at the top. Well, not way at the top, but on the north end of the Temple Mount, there's a little opening called the Sheep Gate. That's where they would enter through. And just north of that, you can see the Pool of Bethesda. The pool, or the word Bethesda, literally means house of grace or house of mercy. And this pool had a reputation that was associated with it. Now you will notice on your handout that verse 4 is missing from the text. Take a look. Do you see where it begins or it has verse 3 and then at the end of verse 3 it just transitions right into verse 5, skips right over verse 4, kind of like the 13th floor of a building? I did not edit that. That's the way the NIV translation reads. This happened because when the King James Version of the Bible was created in the early 17th century, and the King James Version was really the only English translation that we had for a very long time, 
But when it was created, it used as its source material manuscripts of the Gospel of John that was dated around the year 1100 AD. So quite long after the events in, script, in the Bible or in the New Testament. Subsequently, archaeologists have discovered much older manuscripts of John that predate the manuscripts used in the King James Version by hundreds of years. Sometimes they go all the way back very close to even the first century. And these older manuscripts of the Gospel of John don't include verse 4. In fact, some of these older manuscripts that have been discovered, the scribe will include verse 4, but then it will have an asterisk next to it where he basically will indicate that there are older manuscripts that don't include this verse. Therefore, the veracity and the authenticity of this verse is called into question. So let me read to you the New King James Version that continues to include verse 4. And I'll start by reading with verse 3, and you, compare, you can compare the difference with your handout. In verse 3, and that will be up here on the screen, it says, In these, uh, or the colonnades around the pool, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring up of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. And then verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. So because of the omission of verse 4 in these much earlier manuscripts, it's felt by most textual critics, and that's what these people are called who study these things, that what happened is that at some point, one of the scribes felt that it was necessary to explain why there were so many dis disabled people who were waiting around the pool and what this particular lame man in our story is referring to in verse 7 when he talks about the waters of the pool being stirred. And so at some point, a scribe likely added verse 4 letting these readers know that there was a belief among people in that day that an angel of God would stir up the waters of the pool at a certain time and that the first individual who enters into the pool after the water was stirred, which was likely evidenced by bubbles because the, spring was, or the pool was fed by an underground spring, but the first person into the pool after the waters were stirred would be cured of their infirmity. However, since the now discovered much more earlier manuscripts of John don't include this verse, it's very likely that John did not write it. But that a later scribe then added this explanation of this belief that existed in this legend that at that time that he wanted his readers to know in order to explain why this lame man and others were waiting around the pool. Now, uh, given just the volume of scripture and the number of manuscripts that we now have, to me it's amazing how infrequently this actually happens, which I think is evidence to the fact that the text of the Bible was so very carefully copied by scribes and so meticulously done. And, and over the years, with the continued discovery of, of more ancient manuscripts that all substantiate how accurately the text was copied over time, except for a very few infrequent cases like the one that we're looking at, and which in my opinion doesn't really materially detract away from the message of this passage. In fact, in some ways, I think it maybe helps us to understand the context of it a little bit better. But because of all of this, I think we can have a lot of confidence that the New Testament that we have is based on the actual words of the original authors. Okay, anyways, just kind of a side note there to describe the omission of verse 4 in some of your translations. So on this festive occasion, Jesus, for whatever reason, is drawn to this pool near the northern entrance to the city that's believed to have these healing properties and quite possibly is believed to have these properties because of a legend of an angel that would come and stir up the waters. Quite a number of scholars are of the opinion that the angel is not necessarily an angel of God or of Yahweh, but that this is a belief that was quite possibly adopted from Greek culture 
a culture that's very well known to have healing pools in various locations throughout their society. And since the Jewish population of this time was very heavily influenced by Greek culture, this was quite possibly one of those pools, which would explain why John was hesitant to mention it at all in his gospel. If so, it would have been a kind of strange for Jesus, I mean, Jesus does strange things all the time, but it would have been a little strange for Jesus to really even visit such a place. And aside from that, it would have been strange to his disciples that Jesus appears to just randomly approach this man who had been crippled for 38 years and was just waiting by the poolside. But I want you to think about this man first. Okay, let's think about him. For 38 years, this man has been crippled and lame in a society where people in this condition were ostracized and tossed off to the margins. Physical ailments and sin were often conflated such that people felt that your physical disability was somehow the result of some sin that you were now obviously being punished for by God. Or physical ailments and diseases were often conflated during that time so that people really didn't want to get too close to you because they might catch whatever it is that you have. So here this man has been treated like a pariah. I mean, just looked down upon, scorned, ridiculed, mocked, rejected. And not just for his physical disability, but for what his physical disability represented. He wasn't just rotting away physically. He was rotten to the core in the eyes of many people. Unable to work, didn't have any friends or likely even any family near him based on his comment that no one is there to help him. Unable to enter onto the temple grounds and worship with his own people from whom he has been shunned and rejected for 38 years. Almost four decades. And who knows what this does to the heart and to the soul of an individual living in that condition? How hard do you think that this man's heart became through all of the years of rejection and disappointment in his life? How callous did he have to become in order to survive his condition? How hopeless do you think he was at this time before Jesus came into his life? Now most people will look at this story and they'll think of this man and say, wow, he's so far removed or I'm so far removed from the experience of this man. But let me suggest to you, you are not. And maybe we can get honest here because as I've mentioned many times in the past, we all have deep areas of brokenness in our souls. I mean, it could involve an area of shame over something I've done, or maybe something that's been done to me, uh, an area of guilt over something that's happened, or maybe a deep sense of failure or rejection or not measuring up, or some woundedness from some past traumatic event. And for many of us, we have lived with this for more than 38 years. And who knows what that has done to our souls. I am not even sure that we're aware of it much anymore, except for the times when it's exposed unexpectedly. Um, you know, I have this condition in my shoulder called frozen shoulder. I actually had it in my left shoulder and it got, it got better. It's not 100%, but it's better. But it, in, my, in my right shoulder, it, it, it's, it's such that I can't really lift my arm up beyond a certain point before I start to feel pain or in certain directions. It, you know, it hurts. And so my arm has limited mobility before I start to feel pain. And I'm not exaggerating the pain for those of you that might be wondering. <laughs> I mean, you can ask, right? There are other people here that have this condition. I'm not exaggerating the pain. I'm not wimpy, you know. But here's what I've learned about this because it illustrates what we tend to do with pain in our lives. 
we tend to learn to function around the pain. Right? So for me, if there's something that's kind of up high and I can't really reach it well enough anymore, well, then I just go get a stool or a chair or something or I ask someone else to pick it up or reach up and grab it. But you learn to compensate and to manage around the pain to the point where you're not even always generally consciously aware of it anymore until something unexpected happens and some kind of knee-jerk reaction where I, you know, jerk my arm in a certain direction and then it's like, oh my gosh, the searing pain through my shoulder. I think many of us have learned to function around our pain and we are not even generally aware of it. How we've learned to maneuver around our shame and our woundedness and our internal struggles with anger or jealousy or envy or sadness or depression. And who knows how long this has gone on inside of us and how the going on of this over time has crippled our souls in ways that we're probably not even aware of. Jesus comes to this man and he asks him, do you want to get well? Now on the surface, to put it kind of bluntly, to me that kind of sounds like a dumb question to ask. I mean, come on Jesus, this man has been lying here on the ground for 38 years. Of course he wants to get well and walk again. But then that presumes that we know what being well means to this man. Because the implied question inside of Jesus' question is, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Which actually happens to be the most asked question of Jesus throughout the Gospels. At one time, he asked the blind man that question, what do you want? Which you would think would have an obvious answer as well. But you see, many people have a tendency to assume that we know what another person needs or wants particularly if that person is dealing with some kind of obvious challenge or disability. But perhaps what this disabled man wants more than anything else in the world is something other than the healing of his paralysis. If you were to ask him, do you want to get well? He might respond by saying, yes, but then what well or being well means to him and what he wants maybe might not be so obvious to us. He might tell Jesus, well, what I want most is I want to be reconciled to my father. Or Jesus, what I want most, more than anything, is I want to share my life with someone else. Or more than my paralysis, Jesus, what I want most is to be able to be in the temple and worship God in his presence. That's what I want. We don't know. Right? The point being that being well involves much more than just our physical well-being. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who's a paraplegic herself, and if you ever get a chance, uh, you should just read some of what she writes, some of her quotes even, that she's written, and what she said about her condition, and what she's learned throughout this whole ordeal in her life because to me she's one of the more remarkable people when it comes to dealing with this very same situation that the man in the story is dealing with. Uh, she said this, one problem I have with faith healing is that it tends to be focused only on the physical aspect of healing. But Jesus always backed away when people came to him only to get their physical needs met. His real interest was in healing the soul. The question that Jesus asks the paralyzed man is translated in our NIV translation as, do you want to get well? But the word that's translated as well is a word that really conveys more this idea of wholeness. So it could have been translated, and it is translated this way in other translations as, do you want to be whole? which I think has a kind of different nuance to it. I agree with Johnny. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus was always more concerned and placed more importance upon the condition of someone's soul 
And that's why the question that Jesus asks this man, do you want to get well, is a much deeper question than we give it credit for. Because with the healing of this man's physical body, it means that there's now going to be changes in this man's life that he's going to have to adapt to. He'll no longer be this helpless, lame man that no one else expects anything from. Now he may have to go out and find a job. He'll probably have to earn a living and learn how to take care of himself. He'll be expected to contribute back to society. No longer will he be able to just simply rely on the handouts of other people. He will have a whole new set of responsibilities in his life that he never had before. And it's going to require him to change. Not just physically, but there needs to be in him this internal shift that takes place as well. And you can tell by this passage of scripture that he's already behind the eight ball. Because whenever he is confronted by a situation in his life, he tends to offer up excuses. When Jesus asks him if he wants to get well, he doesn't answer the question by just simply saying, yes, I want to be well. He instead goes on this long diatribe about how no one is there to help him down to the waters when the time comes. Later on, when he's at the temple, the Pharisees ask him why he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath, which is something that's forbidden to do on the day of rest. And he responds by pointing his finger at Jesus and saying, this man, he told me to carry his mat. You see, there is in this man a reluctance to accept responsibility, but instead to blame other people or other things around him and play the victim. And part of becoming whole, part of being well, involves the condition of our souls. And Jesus seems to be warning him of this when he runs into him later in the temple and tells him to stop sinning or something worse can potentially happen to him. The condition of this man's soul can send him down a pathway in life where he will eventually wind up in a place that's even worse than when he was paralyzed. It's as if Jesus is saying, okay, you have a new lease on life. I hope that you will now live it from the right place. Don't go back to the same hell of the same bad habits and the same poor attitudes and the same narrow view of your self-pity. Get up, man, and move forward. So, let's pause here for a moment because I want you to consider that question. Do you want to get well? Because in my opinion, wellness and healing as Jesus sees it isn't a passive thing on our part. And I think this is true even on a physical level. Right, people say they want to get well. People know that they're not physically well. And they often know that it's because of their lifestyle habits. Whether it be eating the wrong food, or eating too much food, or not getting enough sleep, or exercise, or working too much. We know we're not well. And we may say that we want to get well, but our actions or our lack of it betray that, well, maybe we don't really mean it. And when it comes to our souls, getting well to me, it is an even scarier proposition. Because it means if I really want to get well, then there are things in me that are going to have to change. Things within me, I now have to own up to and start taking responsibility for. Things like anger maybe, jealousy, lust, greed, addictions, arrogance, anxiety. I mean, I'm gonna have to own up to these and take responsibility for them. And these are hard things for me. They're hard. Right? They're difficult areas of my soul, and I'd rather just not face them. But if you think about it, that to me is the crux of the spiritual life. 
before we can experience the life that God intends for us, there has to be a death. Before there can be a resurrection, there's a crucifixion of our soul. And as difficult as that might sound, there's actually more. <laughs> because for me, it's often the other side of wellness that's even more scarier to me. Because I know in my heart that any healing, any, any wellness, any wholeness that Jesus might bring into my life, he's then going to call me to pay it forward. If we choose to be healed, then we are compelled to become healers ourselves. To reach out to those who are wounded and suffering and hurting and bring the same healing that we ourselves have experienced through Christ. If we really want to be healed, then we have to be prepared to accept a new way of living in this world. We have to be willing to bring that healing and wholeness into the lives of the people around us. For this is surely the ultimate healing that we should all want. The healing and transformation of the whole world for the sake of Christ. So, do you want to get well? <laughs> it's not an easy an question to answer. And you can think about that as we close. Let's pray. Lord, I think, I know for me, I live in this place of wanting to be well, and yet not wanting to face the truth of who I am, not willing to do the part that you call us to. It really is not a passive thing. It's not something that just happens to us, Lord. You are a counselor, and even in my time of counseling, Lord, counselors don't provide you with answers. They help you, Lord, to process through. They come alongside. You are our counselor. In many ways, I think the questions you ask throughout the Gospels reach down into our souls, force us, Lord, to look at ourselves and to realize that you are calling us now that we understand and see truth that sets us free to live in a different way. But it's not easy. Certainly not easy. Wanting to get well, Lord, is one thing. But there's another part of our soul, Lord, that struggles against really wanting to get well. I think deep down inside, we all know we are not well, Lord. And yet I, I sense for so many people the struggle is in accepting the responsibility of walking alongside you and learning to get well. So help us, Lord, to struggle deeply with this question because there's more to it than just simply saying yes. Help us to understand that inside of this question, Lord, is so much more that you want us to live into and to become the kind of people, Lord, um, that will bring healing and wholeness to the world. So we thank you for our time. I uh, pray that you'll be with us as we um, have communion and go to the prayer wall. Um, and we ask that you would bless that time as well. In Jesus' name, amen.